And I was very involved with that. There was a local group, the astronomy section of the Rochester Academy of Science, which is a bunch of astronomy enthusiasts. And I had a lot of friends there and I spent a lot of time and energy doing visual work with uh, large telescopes. You can see on the bottom there, the gold scope, that's a 14 inch diameter Dobsonian scope, which is great for visual uh, work. Uh, but that all kind of stopped. And one year I got a promotion at work I went to grad, back to grad school. Uh, we started a family and I built a house and suddenly there wasn't enough uh, bandwidth to do anything but the things I had to do and that kind of fell away. Uh, so for 30 years, I didn't do an awful lot, but uh, I always knew I was gonna be coming back. There we go. And in my mind, I would do it when I had time and I figured I would have time when I retired. And I retired in 2019. And within 30 days of my retirement, I had my first gear in hand and I started playing around with it. So what kind of imaging do I do? I do deep sky imaging. So I'm talking about nebulae and clusters from our own galaxy and pictures from other galaxies as well. So if you look at these first two images, these are great examples of, of nebulae that are inside our galaxy. These are like between two to 15,000 light years away. They're in the local neighborhood. Often they're involved uh, dust and gases in areas that are bright and they're actually forming new stars, which is why they're so bright. Uh, other galaxies in the bottom two images down here, uh, these are just that, they're other, other galaxies like our own. They go anywhere from two and a half million light years away to a hundred million light years away. Uh, those are the kinds of things I like to go after. These things are far away and the photons that are coming in and, and hitting my camera, sometimes you think about it, the photon has been traveling for 100 million years before it decided to embed itself in the sensor of my camera. That's kind of a neat thought that you're capturing though, though that image and you can play that kind of game. Um, so basically faint subjects that are very far away, that's what I do. Now there's lots of other kinds of photography that you can see with them that's associated with astronomy. There's solar and lunar, planetary, uh, comet photography, aurora, auroras, uh, meteors. They're all in the solar system. They're fascinating. Very different set of technical issues than what I deal with, but that's not really where I go. Everything I do is color. I don't do any uh, you know, black and white kinds of imaging. I do two kinds of color. One is broadband color, which I think of as you know, regular RGB color that you would think of as what we see in our, with our eyes every day. And I do false color imaging with narrow bands, special filters, and they're very, very narrow cuts that only let through uh, photons of the spectrum of light that are emitted by gases that you find in the, in the, in the, in the, out in space. So it's very technical imaging, and the colors have nothing to do with what our eyes see for our, our GMB. As a result of that, they're, they're kind of false color. So, why is this a challenge? Why is it hard to do this kind of thing? Well, the target's very small and they're very faint. What that means is you have to worry about capturing the flux of coming in. And that really is two things. What's aperture you're using as a light bucket to capture those photons? The second is uh, the, the chronic efficiency of the sensor that you use. You have to play games to get those working well. The second thing you can do is you can integrate light over time. Your eyes integrate light over maybe an uh, eighth of a second. But if you can integrate it over um, uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, you're capturing <laughs> a lot more signal. The other problem is when you're busy doing that, the Earth sort of does this thing called turning. So the part in the sky you're looking at, when you're magnifying things, a very small area of the sky, and it's shooting by. Well, that's something you need to have a tracking telescope, and you need to have a guiding system that's keeping an eye on the telescope and making sure things are following. The other problem is night. Night's not always dark. You really need darks, darks nights when you're going out and capturing these. Sometimes you have a full moon or even a partial moon and that can destroy things. So that's gonna work against you. It's not always clear. We live in Rochester. You know, 18% gray skies is pretty standard around here. So trying to find that time when you can actually have not, the moon's not in the way and the, the weather is cooperating is kind of a challenge. The other thing we saw in the last couple of years, and especially this year, smoke plumes from fires in Canada and out west. It was amazing how many nights I lost this year because of the smoke plume just destroying the contrast in the sky. 
Um, sometimes the nights are not very long. In the summertime, when it's most pleasant to do this imaging, you might only get four hours of real darkness. Um, then again, in the winter, you might get almost 12 hours of darkness, but it's not exactly the most comfortable of imaging circumstances. And in general, no matter what time of year it is, over the night, it's going to get colder. And the longer your telescope's out there, things happen. Uh, your astrophotographer begins to shiver because it's cold. Uh, telescopes tend to shrink. They're made of metal. They're made of materials that when they get cold, they'll change their physical dimensions. Well, when you just precisely focus something and everything starts to shift, there goes your focus. So that causes another set of problems. And as it gets cools, you'll get to the dew point and you'll have dew forming on your optics. Again, not a good thing. Now, every problem has a fix. That's the good news. The bad news is every fix probably has its own set of problems that you're going to have to fix. But you get into this cycle. So there's a fairly layered system that you really know how to apply. You need to learn how to apply in order to get the results you're looking for. So I started playing with astrophotography 30 years ago with film. Kind of a nightmare, right? And reciprocity failure in film was pretty bad for long exposures. So I used to bake it in a vacuum to get the moisture out. And then you'd fill it in with hydrogen, nitrogen gas to try to uh, prep the emulsion to be more sensitive. That might take you a week. Then you'd go out and you'd have one long exposure, maybe four hours. And that whole time, you're an eyepiece guiding, making sure that everything's tracking just right. Then a plane goes across the field of view, and your entire two weeks' worth of work is gone, right? Um, so I tried my hand at that. Horrible results. I didn't have a lot of success. But when I came back to it, I kind of found it's a whole new world. You have these computerized go-to telescopes. You know, you calibrate them with the sky, and you tell them what object to go to, and they just sort of find it. Hey, that's pretty cool. Um, plate solving is magical. You don't hear about that so much, but in plate solving, the scope thinks it knows where it's looking, takes a picture, compares it to a database of all stars, and says, that's not it. And it starts a search until it finds exactly what you are looking at. And then it tells the telescope, uh, hey, dummy, you're pointed the wrong way, fix it. But this allows you to really uh, zoom in and, and get exactly what you want to get in a very precise way. Um, uh, that's where computer and network technology and things like that are really helpful. We have CMOS cameras with great sensitivity and built-in cooling, which is really changing the game in terms of the efficiency and the quantum efficiency of what we can capture. Exposures are short and stacked. Instead of a four-hour exposure wrecked by your plane going through the field of view, now there's a whole bunch of little exposures. And if you have something go wrong, you throw one out, but you still have all the other ones you can put back together. So it's kind of nice. Automation is really becoming king. You can have autofocus happening so that as the temperature changes, we can compensate for that. Guiding is a secondary system, which is completely autonomous. It works on its own and makes sure that things are happening right. And even the complex sequence of things you have to do are done by computer controlled and software. So automation is making things simpler. Big deal is processing is now digital, not chemicals. So much you can do with such powerful tools, to really extract and highlight very faint features. So for me, this is a whole new world. <laughs> when I was a kid in a candy shop, I had a great time playing with these technologies. So key enablers for doing deep sky imaging. You better have an interest before you just start doing this kind of thing. You better have drive because there's a lot of things you're going to have to learn that you didn't know before. So you better be really driven to do that. You better have a few dollars because you have to buy some toys and put them together to make them do things. Um, you got to have access to the sky, which sounds like a real no-brainer, but people who live in a city have access to skies that are so bright they can't do anything. Uh, we built our house in a nice uh, piece of land in Menden because it had wonderful trees everywhere. Well, now I'm doing astrophotography, and I'm swearing at those trees every time I go out there because they block my sky. So you have to have reasonable access to the sky. You better have a supportive spouse if you're married because you're going to be doing weird things at weird tired times of the night, and... Patience is something your family is going to have to have. But the big thing, time. Time is the big thing. When I'm planning a session, trying to figure out what I'm going to do for an imaging project, I can take a couple of hours to work out all the details. Setting up my gear and taking it down could be an hour and a half every night. Um, I probably want three to five nights to get enough data to make it worth processing. Um, processing for one imaging project can take me three days. Sometimes it's taking all of the images I captured and crunching them down, and that's just sheer computer power, and the computer's chugging away in the background while I'm drinking coffee. 
Other cases, it's all the layered processing I have to do to get things going. I have a website where I document each one of my projects and every step I took in the processing and I share that with people who are trying to learn. Um, that write that write up takes me two or three days. So a project can be 11 days of work in order to get that final image. So yeah, if you're busy and you don't have a lot of time, that's a little difficult. I'm retired. I can do whatever I want now. So my very first telescope rig, I got it within 30 days. It's a 5.1 inch uh, APO refractor with a nice go-to mount um, and a one-shot color camera, which means it's a sensor with a bear pattern on it. Every picture you take is a color picture. Uh, great starting package. Uh, I told my wife I was kind of interested in doing this. And she was supportive, but, you know, don't rush into it. Make sure you know what you're doing. Sort of had what I wanted. Called the technical support line for a vendor. And I asked a few technical questions. They're very helpful. And then I said, you know, this stuff's pretty hard to get now. Supply is pretty tough, especially during COVID. Oh, yeah, almost impossible. You know, I got one of these scopes with, with that someone hasn't claimed yet. And these mounts we haven't had for six months. We're getting a shipment in. There's one more uh, available than we have back orders for. You know, if you want, you could lock that down right now. I pulled out my credit card and it was very easy to do. I had to tell my wife what I just had done without talking to her. I just spent six and a half thousand dollars. And that was not so easy to do. <laughs> but I ended up with my first set of gear. Yeah, can I just ask, uh, I looked up the specs online just because I was curious how it related to the, the different designs of telescopes we studied here. You mentioned this is all lenses, right? This is a refractor. And uh, it's not a bare bones refractor, guys. We studied, we assume thin lenses, very basic optics. If you look at the design of this guy, uh, it's got some triple lenses in there yep. to do that chromatic aberration correction that we talked about being one of the Achilles heels of refractors. So it, it's a nice scope. At, at the price point I looked at, it was exactly what you were saying. Yep. It was, you know, certainly. Uh, these are very quality scopes. Um, this is probably bigger than I needed to start with. But I usually do things the hard way. I, I thought this was a really good size scope because it's 5.1 inches. I hadn't pictured how heavy it was. You know, you're trying to assemble this thing in the early night. That's not too bad. Five in the morning when you want to take it down and you're blurry eyed and you're carrying this heavy optical thing that you really don't want to drop. Uh, less convenient. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is not an inexpensive tube. But this is a pretty common setup for astrophotography today. Often smaller than this, but same basic ideas. One of the reasons it's done that way is because it's kind of a sealed tube, right? You have the optics in the front and the camera in the back and everything's sealed and it keeps dust out. You don't have a lot of alignment issues, things like that. It's very convenient when you're setting it up and taking it. So I had a lot to figure out. I knew how, how do you put it together? How do you make the pieces work together? Um, I got the cameras connected and working and I, during the daytime, I pointed it at some trees really, really far away and got a rough focus on the leaves. Um, and the first night I did the polar alignment uh, by using a bore scope, looking down the polar axis and lining it up with a, with the uh, pole star, which is not good for a guy with bad knees and a bad back. And you're kneeling in the driveway looking up, and it was it was it was torture. Yeah. But I got it. I did the two star calibration on the mount. And I had it go and point at uh, an object that was well positioned that I was familiar familiar with because I've seen it in a telescope many times. Um, I had it look at Messier eight, the Lagoon Nebula. Uh, and then I told it to start, and nothing happened. I figured, well, something's not wrong. And I wasn't thinking. I told it to do a 60-second exposure. The 60-second exposures take 60 seconds. you got to wait for it, right? And suddenly, on my screen, I saw this image pop up. This is the actual image that happened then. I was so excited, I took a picture of my cell phone instead of my family, who really didn't care. But <laughs> I had to share it with them. But to me, that's more detail than I'd ever seen visually. And I didn't know what I was doing. So I went ahead and I had a little simple piece of software and I told it to do 14 60 second exposures. Then I used some free software to try to put together. And I created my very first astrophoto image. It's Messier 8 again. A um, few points to make here. So 14 minutes of integrated exposure, not a lot. Really terrible focus because I didn't quite know how to do focus at the time. I had no guiding. No calibration frames because I didn't know how to do any of that stuff yet. Um, this is a color camera. Anybody seen the color? <laughs> the software needed the Bayer pattern to decode the color. I didn't know that, so you know, color for me, thank you. Didn't matter. 
This is the most detail I'd ever seen in that image in 30 years of playing around with telescopes. I mean, I can see the cluster in the center where the new star, stars have just formed. I can see the swirls of dust, which is where they, they developed from. I can even, as you look around, you see these little nodules down there? These are dust clouds that are collapsing. Those are going to be stars someday. And that's what I got from my very first image that I did so poorly. So that was pretty exciting for me. It was encouraged me to go on and do more. So here's a few more of my first early images. First one here is M57, the ring nebula. It looked like a ring. Yeah. You know, I, I, got some, I got a picture of it means something. This is uh, the witch's broom, which is uh, part of the veil nebula. Very, very faint, challenging object. But I got a hint of it. Uh, this is the uh, Mesa 16, the Eagle Nebula. Uh, in the center in here is the Pillars of Creation. Have you ever saw the Hubble telescope picture, that real famous image? I could sort of see the pillars, sort of, you know, so, but I was pretty happy with that. And this is the Crescent Nebula, and I even picked up a little color on the edge of the crescent. These were bad images. I didn't care. They were images where I was seeing things. I was getting data through the telescope. I was learning how to process it. Yeah, the blacks are all clipped, and yeah, the stars are all clipped on the other end. There's no color to them, and the color is all over the map. I did Photoshop, and I didn't know what I was doing, and, uh, but my first results were, were important, and first results for everyone are important because you went through so many barriers to get here. Now you can start to hone your craft. Yeah, could I ask, um, I'm sure on your screen there, their, their colors are popping out. Would you mind if you just tried a light experiment? Where I... Yeah. You let me know if this is too dark for you, but let me see if I can drop you. Wow. Are you okay with the lights off? I can deal okay, with it. Okay, great. I think that might be. I mean, you, yeah, you can see the images. Images. there's not much to talk about, right? <laughs> so so this was this was a learning opportunity for me, right? And over time I kept working at it. And within a year or so, suddenly my images started to look a little bit different. I went back. I, I tend to go back and reshoot my same same objects every year, trying to see if I've gotten it any better. So that's the uh, ring nebula. And yeah, I think I've got a little bit more detail coming through now, including the little the galaxy that's right, uh, right to the north of that. Um, now I've gotten a little bit more detail coming through on the uh, on the uh, veil nebula. I'm really happy where I ended up being able to go with uh, the eagle nebula. And the Crescent Nebula is a fascinating area that there's so much detail there that you can pull out if you know how to go extract that data, that suddenly now it's getting interesting and I'm having even more fun working with the images. So how do I learn all this stuff, right? Well, I did background in imaging science, great, but it helped in some ways, but it hurt in others because a lot of the instincts that I've honed on image processing over the years are the wrong things to do for these very, very dim things. But uh, books from Amazon were something that helped a lot. YouTube, I tend to do, I tend to do um, about 90 minutes of treadmill every day, uh, just fast walking. And I run YouTube videos. There's tons of videos out there training you on different aspects of this, so I played with that. Um, I looked at a lot of different photo sites and websites for people who are enthusiastic about this. One big connection though, I joined the local club again, and I met two or three guys who were been doing astrophotography for 10 years, they've been published. They knew what they were doing. Often I didn't. And then having that connection was hugely helpful, right? They would tell me when I was doing things wrong. I would ask questions, they'd clarify, I'd give them early images, and they'd tell me what I, what I could do better. And that networking and, and, and interaction was huge help. Then I started my own website so I could document my projects, and I thought I was sharing what I was doing. Maybe that would help others. Instead, I got a lot of people coming back and making suggestions that actually helped me. I found that the, doing the website was a two-way street. You know, I was helping other people, but they were engaging with me, and that worked out great. And then a lot of my own experimentation and trial and error, and a lot of error was involved there. Um, but what shocked me is this journey that I've taken, I thought would be a very personal one, turned out that I was tapping into a very broad community of people who are enthusiastic about this all over the world. I now correspond with people in countries I've never even heard of before because of a common interest. Um, and so that's made it kind of a fascinating pursuit as well. So typical journey for an astrophotographer is getting your gear. You think like you buy your gear and you're done. 
Nope. There's gear acquisition syndrome in this hobby, just like a lot of others. So you're never done getting your gear. Getting your very first images, we just talked about that, going through a lot of hurdles to get there. Maximizing the quality of your captured data. I found that after about a year, you almost plateau on that. You get pretty confident in getting solid data. Then the next challenge is the image processing. There's is, there's is a lot of opportunity, a lot of learning. I don't think you ever are done learning because there's always new tools and new techniques, new ways of doing things that you didn't have before. And so you're constantly learning the best way to extract information. I found I could take an image I took two years ago and take the, the more recently released tools and I'd get a better image out of that. Data. So that part is very interesting and you never uh, stop learning there at all. Finally, there's this thing called developing your inner eye. And you don't try to do it, it just happens. You learn what you think these images should look like. The data is the data. You're, you're presenting that data in a certain way. And you have your own signature way of processing, which brings them out. Um, you can also sometimes tell who did an image by how it was processed. I've always maintained that if I had one data set I gave to 10 astrophotographers, I'd get back 10 very different images that were very good because they all put their own sort of spin on that data set. What kind of data are you looking at? Like, is it just a series of maybe like 10 images you put together? I'll show you. Okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, so let's look at what goes into creating an image. I'm going to take one particular image in particular. I'm going to take um, MESA 27, the dumbbell nebula which is in the constellation Volpecula, which is the Fox. You probably don't know it because it's shown by two stars with a wide segment between it, so it's not super memorable. But it is sandwiched between two well-known constellations, Cygnus, which is the Northern Cross, and Aquila, which is the Eagle. And here's a rig, this is a broadband color image that I took from it. If you looked at this visually with a telescope, think of a black and white version of that, and that's pretty much what you see. Um, it's a circle where the ends look like they've been bitten out and they're a little darker, plus the name of the dumbbell. It's also known as NGC 6853 and sometimes called the Apple Court. Um, it's about 1,200 light years away. It was the first nebula ever, or the first planetary nebula ever discovered by Charles Messier in 1764 and ended up on the Messier list. Now, you might think that Messier was going out collecting all these wonderful things to look at in the sky, and he created his own list, and that's not quite what happened. He was a fanatical comet searcher, as were a lot of his contemporaries. And he would look visually through the sky, and he'd see this fuzzy patch, and he'd think, oh, good, I discovered a comet, and I'm going to be famous for it. Then I'd discover that it doesn't change in position night after night. It can't be a comet. It's a false comet. So he kept a list of these false comets, and he shared it with all of his contemporaries, so these are like the garbage of the sky that got in the way of discovering comets. Today, it's seen as the most, the brightest and most interesting objects that are in the sky. So kind of interesting how they flip the script, the script on that. Um, we know because we had pictures of almost 100 years ago taken of this, and now that um, it's expanding. And 10,000 years ago is when an event happened which caused this particular nebula. So planetary nebulas are stars or at the end of their life when they shed the outer layers of their atmospheres. So here's two other ones. We already talked about the ring nebula down here. This is the helix nebula that I took. These are other examples of planetary nebula. As I said, uh, basically, a red giant stars at the end of their life will shed their outer atmospheres. What's left contracts down to a white dwarf, and often that very bright white dwarf will uh, irradiate that expanding shell of gas and make it glow. That happens between uh, stars have a solar mass between one and eight solar masses. So our own star will end in something like this. Um, kind of interesting that shell of gas that's kicked out because the star is ending its life, it's gone through its nu nucleosynthesis and it's evolved and created all the heavier elements. So all that debris that's being kicked out. Uh, and it's happened star after star through millennia. That's so-called star stuff that Carl Sagan says we're made from. That's where all those elements come from, these stars at the end of their life. They call it a planetary nebula because in old-day telescopes, it looked like a resolved disk, like it might be a planet. 
they just didn't follow the rules of motion that uh, all the other plants do. So they didn't know what it was, and they call it a planetary nebula because it looked like a planet. So my goal when I shot this, I shot it in broadband before. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do a narrow band capture, and I wanted to do a very long integration because I'd seen a few pictures like this right here where there was this, this outer shell of gas you don't normally see. And I thought, maybe I could try to capture that. So let's talk about the observatory. This is not my observatory. This is my observatory. I live in a tree lot in Menden, and if I look south down my driveway, I have a chunk of sky that I can actually see things through. So I have to wait at night for something to pass away from the trees here so I can see it until it crashes into these trees here, and then I'm done. Sometimes when it's very low, I have a very narrow window. So this is what I'm imaging with, so it's not optimal. If you look to the north over here, um, there is a convenient hole in the tree canopy that allows me to see Polaris, which I need to use to line up the polar axis of my drives so that they're tracking the Earth right. I say convenient, it wasn't that convenient. I had guys with chainsaws hanging from ropes cutting that hole in the tree so I can see Polaris and do that. By the way, that's not an actual image of Polaris, it's just an incredible simulation. So um, I took a planetarium software, a free package, and I mapped my tree line onto it. And so now, I can look for any time of the year and I can take a particular object and figure out exactly when it emerges from the trees and when it crashes back into the trees. And for me, I get about three hours of exposure that I can get with that. Recently, that went up to four hours when I had tree people come back and cut back the outline of the trees a bit so I got a little bit more access. So this is my observatory. I have three scopes. They're set up in my driveway. You'll see two carts there with three laptops on it that are driving everything. And each cart has a fan on it. You don't have a guess why there would be, there need to be a fan on that? Get very hot. Nope. So you get very hot. Nope. Mosquitoes. <laughs> That's the <laughs> time of the year you're sitting out there and they'll just <laughs> descend on you. Having moving air there uh, chases away the mosquitoes. So you, these are the, these are the real intricate aspects of this that you have to learn. Right? <laughs> so let's talk about the gear I use for this one. This again is not the gear. Uh, these are my telescopes, the middle telescope, the one I first showed you. It looks a little bit different now because I just stewed it with more gadgets and things. Uh, I now have uh, two other telescopes. Uh, about a month after I got in trouble buying this scope with my wife, I ended up buying this telescope. And if we have time in the question and answer, um, ask me about that because it's kind of interesting how I fell into this. But this telescope has my longest focal length, about 1085. Uh, that gives me a field of view of about 1.2 to 5 degrees versus 0.8. My smallest telescope has a focal length of 400 millimeters, and it covers about twice as much area as sky. And of course, this guy is right in the middle. This is purposeful. Different objects can be quite large. The Andromeda galaxy um, is the is about eight full moons in length. It's huge up there. It's just so faint you don't normally see it. So sometimes you need a real wide field of view, and other times you need something more narrow. Because the planetary nebulas are very small, I use the, my uh, long focal length scope on that. This is an astrophysics, 130 millimeter star fire. It's not a fast scope, it's an F8. So it's kind of a slow configuration, yeah. but because it has that image scale, it's very handy. So what's its purpose, right? Well, it's the light bucket. So uh, I've got a 130 millimeter objective that's ca catching flux coming in a photon. Human pupil, maybe five to seven millimeters. So that's about uh, 345x the ability to capture photon and flux coming in. And then, of course, it also magnifies. So this is about a 22x magnification. So that's what the scope is contributing. Then, if you look right here, you see this little blue box right there. That's a focus motor, it's a high torque, uh, high torque motor that precisely drives the focus gears. When it's at a position, it holds it there rigidly, but it also can move it around. And when you combine this with a camera and software, you can create an autofocus capability. So software that controls this will actually take the point of focus, back it off, take a picture, measure the sizes of the stars in that image, step it in a little bit, take another picture, measure it, and you'll create this curve. 
where the stars are getting smaller and smaller as you approach focus, and then you go past focus and it goes up. So this is a way of getting autofocus. And basically, autofocus routine kicks in when you first start up, uh, when you change a filter, because you're changing the optics. Um, when you have a change of temperature within one degree. Um, I have that set up so it detects that automatically and will kick in. And I just focus every 30 minutes because who knows, right? Gravity is working on things. I want to make sure things are sharp. The next thing I have in here is a camera rotator. This allows me remotely to rotate the camera in a very precise way. This is really important when you set up a composition to look at things in a particular way and you're shooting uh, three hours one night and I have to come back the next night and do it another three hours. Um, and sometimes I'm doing two or three objects a night if I have a long night that's dark. Uh, so I need to be able to position the rotation accurately. And with plate solving, I can actually do this very precisely. Um, this is my this is a snapshot of uh, my control software. And in the planning phase, I can pick up an object. In this case, this is the tulip nettle. It'll pull a, a polymer sky survey plate in. I can drag a rectangle on it. It'll show me exactly the field of view that I'll get with this telescope and this camera and that combination. And I can rotate that as well as move it around so I can frame it just the way I want it to be framed. And the software will grab that and it'll precisely use the camera rotator and the positioning of, of everything else to create the image I want when I'm ready to start. But for cameras, deep sky astrophotographers use uh, fluid types. Sometimes they're just regular uh, DSC cameras. Sometimes they're modified where they take the filters off the sensors, so the IR or UV filters have been removed. Uh, sometimes they're dedicated astro cameras, like this one. This is a one-shot color camera. So the sensor has a bare pattern on it and every image coming off is a color image. But it has cooling capability. So that as the chip is operating, it's creating thermal noise. It can reduce that by dropping the temperature 20 degrees centigrade below the ambient temperature. And then there's a mono version of that. There's no layer pattern on the sensor. And everything is coming through and being seen in the same way. In that case, if you're doing color, you need a filter wheel. And this is the filter wheel assembly up here, which will rotate a filter in, and you take exposures through that. Now, it's a little bit more complicated because if you want a regular blue image, I have to have a series of red, green, and blue exposures, and I have to put them together and then combine them into a color image. So there's more images and more processing that gets involved. But that's what I use. Also, there's cooled and non-cooled. If I'm doing planetary images where things are bright and exposures are short, I don't need a cooling system. When I'm doing all night imaging with a faint object, I need a cooling system. This is the back of the camera and you can see the camera and you can see the filter wheel. This particular filter wheel holds seven 36 millimeter filters. Why 36 millimeter? Because that's big enough that it won't cut into the corner light as it's coming down to the camera. Um, some people go, go bigger, the filters get very expensive. So I get as small as I can get away with and still not cut into the corner light. The camera I'm using is a new generation camera which has a much better quantum efficiency than just the ones that were sold a year ago. We'll take a look at that in a second. So here's the inside of the filter holder. You can see the filters are bolted in place. Um, there's gonna be four filters for broadband. These are about hundred nanometer wide cuts and they let me get red, green, and blue colors and the luminous one spans the entire space. So these let in a lot of light and a lot of traditional color imaging. Then the narrow band using hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, and sulfur two. Um, and we'll talk about those in a second. This is what the filters actually look like. Yeah. This yes. might be the first time we've, as a class, discussed the use of you know rotating filters for different captures. So you're saying you uh, have a sensor that it's going to capture the same number of pixels no matter what. No matter you what. just want to make it sensitive to different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Right. So you sequentially go through all the filters that are in this wheel, and then you can build up a right. color image based These on... Filters throw away light, right? They give you a window. If I have a red filter, it's trying to throw away all light except for red, right? Um, and again, with 100 nanometers wide, that's a pretty good chunk of, of the spectrum that is pulling in and calling red. Uh, and you can see here, here we have, you know, 100 nanometers of red, green, then blue, and then the luminous is spanning this entire space. Contrast that over here with the narrowband filters. 
these are tight cuts, sort of 100 nanometers wide. These are three to five nanometers wide. Tiny, tiny. They throw away lots of light. In some ways, that's good because you're throwing out all the things in the atmosphere that was like light pollution. The only thing coming through is really something that came from that particular device or uh, object or target you're going after. It increases the confidence. But on the other hand, you threw away so much light, you have water exposure. If you get a feel for it, these are very, very narrow, and they're lined up for specific molecules that when they're in an ionized state, glow in a certain light at specifically that part of the spectrum. It throws everything else away. So this can be doing some really interesting technical imaging, but you don't get true rigor and blue color. You get false colors from it. I talked about the quantum efficiency of the sensor. This is the quantum efficiency of the sensor across the, the spectrum from the last generation. The very peak is about 60%. So 40% of the light isn't being captured at all. The new generation, I don't have a plot of that, but this same curve goes up to 90%. So just one year difference in the cameras has made a real substantial change in what can be captured. With the narrowband filters, can you computer and use a computer to change it back to what it should be, the color? You can play games with how you map the colors, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. Yeah, now you, you're gonna do a false color. Well, how do you put them together to create any color? You have a lot of flexibility in that. Okay, now the mount, we've talked about these mounts. These mounts have to track the sky. And so I have a go-to mount that's set up uh, to handle a 60 pound load. In other words, the optical tube assembly can weigh as much as 60 pounds. Rule of thumb in astrophotography is you only use half that. So my tube assembly weighs about 30 pounds um, and it's very precisely balanced. You, on, the, on the worm gears that are driving, you don't want a lot of, of weight. So you make sure everything's balanced so that it, it can be moved with a feather touch. Then it's sitting on this, this, this pier tripod, which is sturdy, but fairly lightweight. And the shape of it actually is very useful, as you'll see in a minute, for how I choose to set up my gear. I told you I did a polar alignment by sitting on my knees, looking up through this, <laughs> this polar scope. Got rid of that very quickly. This is a camera that actually mounts at the very end of the, the polar uh, axis. And it looks at the sky where the, the North Star would be that you want to align with. Now you can look on a computer and it'll say, say well, here's what you're seeing. Here's a plate um, solving. Here's where, where you want to be. And it gives you this fiducial that allows you to, to real time change the aiming of the telescope to get things lined up quickly. What used to take me 20 minutes, now I can do about three or four minutes. So every one of my telescopes has a camera like this. And it's much more comfortable for my knees and back. Um, this is the guiding system. It's a complete subsystem. So this is a wide angle uh, telescope. It has its own mono camera. I happen to have a focuser on here so I can remotely trim the focus on it too. Uh, the job here is it's looking at the field of view. And if your mount is doing its job, the stars that it's looking at don't shift during the exposure. But if there's something going on and there's some slight drift, it'll detect it and send controls to the, the mount, which overrides that within a second. So that it doesn't register on your camera sensor. So it's kind of doing the tweaking to make sure everything comes out to where you want it. And this is a completely autonomous system. You put it on, you turn it on, and it does its job. And it's amazing how well it works. Finally, I have this little guy here. This is a uh, RH temperature sensor. And it's actually tracking the dew point. And as the telescope begins to get to the point where I do it form, it'll send controls out to some radiative uh, thermal heating strips right along the lens, just to heat it up enough to keep the dew off, not enough to mess up the optical performance. So that's how we control the dew. And of course, we have computers that are controlling it. Every telescope has its own laptop. It runs the control software. I use AnyDesk so that while it's running in the driveway, I'm in my den with a big monitor watching multiple scopes run, so I don't have to be outside too much. And then I use Dropbox as each image is collected, goes to the cloud so I can analyze it inside and not have to worry about something happening to the laptop I leave the day. So now I gotta get a plan. Well, got a target, we pick one. You need dark skies, so you're gonna have to look at what's going on in terms of moon phases. The new moon is really where you wanna do most of your exposures in a few days on either side. 
that's when it's dark enough you can really do the kind of image you want. The rest of the time, the moon's in the way, and there's just no point in trying to do it. Um, you got to figure out when is it going to be dark enough to start and when do you have to stop? And that's a function of the time of year and where you're located on the globe. For us, you know, we end up with about four hours in the summertime and almost 11 hours uh, in the winter. Uh, so, you know, we have quite a bit of a difference there. So imaging can be quite different depending on what time of year it is. Finally, you need clear skies. And we talk about clouds, we talk about smoke. And most astrophotographers buy into software that looks at four or five weather models in, in real time does the predictions, gives you access to real-time satellite feeds, and even tracks models of where the smoke's going to be so that you can figure out what your odds are of having a decent night. Then you want to plan out your sequence. We just talked about with the color filters. You have to move them in, take a bunch of exposures, then move on to another set of another filter, more exposures, and you have to have a complete set if you want color. And as you zoom in here, you can see that there are different kinds of events. These are light events where I'm capturing information from the target. And I can name it. I can tell what filter it's going to use. I can tell the exposure. And I can tell how many I want to do. Then when I'm done with all of those, I can do calibration frames. We do two kinds of calibration. One is where you put the lens cap on the system. And it's just looking at what the noise of the sensor is when everything starts. There's another one where we use a flat white source of light. And I'll show you that in a second. And the idea there is to characterize the nature of the optics. Most line fourth fall off and be moving in the system. You can characterize that. Dust that got into the optics might be out of focus and causing dust donuts and things like that. It documents that so we can calibrate that out as well. All this is controlled by this software. So when I go to set up, I used to take the pieces out one at a time and set them up and assemble them. It took me like three hours. I only got smart and I leave my telescope set up in my garage and a friend of mine helped me to design something that would make it a little bit more convenient. So I, I have three scopes I set up during the daylight hours, I set up the physical gear. At twilight, I can start firing up all the software and get things ready. When it's truly dark, I can do the alignments, I can test the cameras, I can cool the cameras down to temperature. And I can run plate solver to mount, to calibrate the mounts so the mounts know where they're pointing. But what I found is a lot easier is to keep the scopes all assembled, keep them in the garage. And I built this device called my, my scope lifter. And it literally, I put it up to the, to, to the telescope, strap it on. I lift it up, uh, carry it to the driveway, drop it on magical painted spots in the driveway. Uh, and now my setup takes minutes to get things transported. To give you an idea what that looks like, I'll show you a snippet of a video I had on my website. I realized when I was setting up, I had a security camera. I'll bet you to watch me set this whole thing up. Maybe I'll get a video on it. You notice, like, the difference between spring and or uh, fall and summer, your driveway shifting. Good, but when I do the calibrations, every time I set up, it counts. Gives you a little bit of a feel. So when I'm actually running things, I'm inside the house, and this is what I see on my screen. Uh, this is three different telescopes capturing projects. This happens to be uh, when I was capturing the M27 data because there's one frame coming back from it. And I have a little security camera that I can I can steer around and look at the gear and listen to the gear and make sure that things are working the way I need them to work. So let's talk about the capture. When you're capturing, you have to slew to the target, you have to autofocus, you have to center and plate solve so you know where you're pointing. You have to start the guiding subsystem and then you can do your sequences of image capture for the various filters that you want. And, this, and then we get calibration frames. The software knows all of this. It's been pre-programmed and it knows how to do all those things. And while it's doing things, it'll throw you throw uh, informational screens up that show you how it's going about its work and how it's trying to solve all the various problems. This particular screen is dealing with the centering and pointing and rotation, making sure that that's accurate. Uh, just to give you a feel for what it looks like when you start it up. 
just started the sequence and it's now just slewing to the first target. That's as fast as it moves when it's doing its slewing. Once it's gotten to the position it thinks it targets it, it starts taking an exposure to see if that's really accurately pointing. And it'll do a series of those until it zooms in and what we want. So I talked about calibration. This is my flat frame calibration. It's basically an LED tracing screen with some closed cell foam around it. It's hanging on the end of the tube and I take a series of exposures that way, which are then stacked together and it characterizes the optics, it characterizes dust, and then I can move, remove that as part of the calibration process. So uh, these images were all captured on the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of August in 2022. Uh, I had 39 uh, 300 second exposures for the hydrogen alpha, 38 for the oxygen three, and 46 for the uh, S or the sulfur two. So about 10 and a quarter hours of total integrated time. However, I had a whole bunch of calibration frames. We put that all together. There was 378 different files that were captured in those three nights that have to be dealt with. And just to give you a little bit of a feel for how this works. Um, one of the things that I do is I take those individual exposures, I string them together, and I create a movie, and I watch how each of the frames change. And when you look at the movie of that, you'll see sometimes the sky changes its brightness. You'll see that some clouds might move by. You might see a little bit of motion in the stars because the system's so smart that every time it starts a new exposure, it shifts things a little bit so that it lines up on the grid of your sensors slightly differently and changes how the sap goes happens. So you'll see a little bit of that going on. To get an idea what these look like, I'll just play one of these. Lost my mouse drive. It's the doesn't seem like a lot's happening. You see a little bit of variation. See some clouds going by. And that's a plane that just shot through the field. <laughs> so even though you have a narrow thing like that, you get meteors going through, you have satellites coming through. Those are all things you have to deal with. All right, so the pre-processing. I got all this data and I have to crunch it down to the starting image. Um, so all the calibration frames, all the light frames have to be processed and combined together. This process is called stacking sometimes. It involves cosmetic correction, which is fixing defects, defects on the CMOS sensor itself. It does calibration normalization of each frame. It does registration, so all the frames are lined up precisely the way they need. And then you integrate them together, and images are assembled from that to create a, one that has better signal and noise. Stacking process is based on the square root of the number of subframes. So we have about 40 subframes. So the square root of that is about 6.3 improvement in the signal and noise. If I want to double that, I'd have to go up to 144 frames. So as you start to have longer exposures, you have diminishing return. So what's in our light frame? If, if I took an exposure that's very, very, very short and hit a lens cap on, I'd still get some kind of noise signal. We call that the bias noise. Then if I actually, if I had a 300 second exposure and I took one with no light, I had the lens cap on, running the chip that long heats it up and that heat will generate noise. So that's kind of a thermal thing that we get out of dark noise. Then we just talked about the flat signal and that's how the optics shape the signal coming through. We calibrate that. Then we have, finally we have light and some of that light kind of came from the target, but so some of that light might be from your neighbor's porch light. It might be from atmospheric glow. We don't know. It's just that it's, it's the light that's entering the system. So calibration, since we've taken dark frames and flat frames, we can subtract that off. So that all we're really dealing with is light signal. So the process here is we have all these subframes. We want to combine them into one master frame. And if I look at one subframe here, you can see stuck pixels. pixels. You can see a lot of noise. And you can see that a lot of the features are kind of hard to, hard to see. But as you stack them together, um, the things that are really there reinforce one another. Noise isn't the same each time. It doesn't reinforce. So by doing that, we can create an improvement in the signal of noise. And here you can see 
um, a lot more of the features in the nebulosity and a lot more of the stars which are stronger than they were before. And the noises have been reduced. It's not eliminated, but it's been reduced. So think of having this 30 samples of an image. You have one pixel. You can create a Gaussian distribution. If you take the average of that, you're going to have something better than you got in each of the contributors. And because it's a Gaussian-like distribution, you can use statistical methods to throw out things. So you have a pixel that looks like one frame that the airplane went through it. That frame doesn't look like any other frames. We can throw that out. So this is my workstation here. I have two 32-inch monitors. And that PC is a multi-core PC uh, put together just to drive the kind of processing I have to do. So after everything's done, you come up with this wonderful master image. That's it. That's what you see. You see a little bit of feature and a couple of stars. And so what's going on here? Let's look at a histogram of that image. Well, that's the histogram. That's the statistics. And you can see there's 25 million pixels there, but you don't see anything. But in fact, you really have something to see. Because there's a line right here going up right near zero. And there's actually uh, instances all the way along in here. You can see that the minimum is a very low number. This is normalized between zero and one, by the way. Uh, and I have pixels that are all the way up. What's happening is I have stars that are spread all the way across the bottom, and all the nebulosity is crushed near the, to the zero point. And if I zoom in on that part of the histogram, you can see this is the little normal distribution of the signal I got. There's not a lot there, and it's just barely above the noise threshold. So in order to work on it and see anything, you put a transfer function on it that scales up the, the values what, what they're displayed on the screen so you can see what you're actually dealing with, but you're not really changing the values of the pixels that are in the image because that's what you do with processing. So here are the master signals I got back from this project. Hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, sulfur two. First thing I find fascinating is this is the same object, but when you look at it in, with narrow band filters, looking at just the different molecules, look how very different the images are. The hydrogen, hydrogen alpha, it's lacy and it's filled and symmetric. And it's a really interesting structure. But if you look at the oxygen three, it's soft and, and sinuous and almost angel-like. But if you look at the sulfur, there's nothing in that shell at all. There's no sulfur there, so you don't see it. This looks more like you would see with a broadband in it. Now, I had to put those together to form color. Um, and how do I do that? Well, the Hubble Space Telescope takes a lot of images like that, and they pioneered a way of doing it, which they call SHO. That's where the sulfur is mapped onto the red, the hydrogen is mapped onto the green, and the oxygen is mapped onto the blue. But, you know, you have other ways to do that. The first one here is the Hubble method. Here's another method where, since there isn't a lot of sulfur data, throw it out and just double the oxygen. Uh, and they call that HOO. Or you could do all kinds of arbitrary blends. There's no wrong answer. These aren't true colors. You pick something that helps you show what's going on technically. And from an artistic point of view, sometimes you just do it because it looks good and you like what you see. So here's the starting image. And we want to get it to that. How do you do that? Well, there's a pretty complex flow. We know we started with three master images. I created a color image because uh, I have a smart deconvolution tool which uses AI technology that likes to work on color images. So I create a color image and run that. But then I quickly split out the colors again, and then I started processing each one of the color images using a series of masks that let me work on different portions of the image to do the things that need to be done to bring out those selected portions. And then from that, I'll create a new color image and I'll create a synthetic luminance image. Since my goal here was to try to bring out the features in this outer shell, and that only shows up in the hydrogen alpha and oxygen three, I created a, a, a synthetic luminance image with just those two filters. And then I enhanced that the best I could. These are all folded back together to get you to give you the final image. So here's what aberrations look like. These are really good lenses, but at the edge of the field, you still have chromatic aberration. Um, and the uh, smart deconvolution routine knows that and fixes that. You can see where it's circularized and fixed the distortions in the corner. 
Next thing it really wants to do is try to enhance the sharpness that's lost in the optical process. So using uh, that tool to do deconvolution, you can see that the bloated stars are contracted, much more sharp and pinpoint. And some of the other features are a lot crisper when they're using that. Next thing you might want to deal with is noise. And again, we have these smart AI tools now that are beginning to attack noise. And they do a very nice job of reducing that and creating a much smoother field that looks fairly natural. I mentioned that I use masks to selectively go after it. It's not unusual for me to have 50 or 60 masks for a certain project as I work on tuning different aspects of the image. In this particular case, what I've really done here is I have a mask for working on the core, I have a mask for working on the whole nebula, or just the outer areas. And that gives me a lot of control and I can do a lot of processing to bring about an enhancement there. So processing can take three days. This talk isn't about processing. I tried to think of something to give you a feel for what that might look like. So I created a fast little stop action video that shows the processing that went over three days, uh, compressed down about 30 seconds. We'll see how this works out. That gives me almost my final image, almost. Then what I do is I go to Photoshop and I do some final tweaks that are based, basically visual preferences that I put on. But I also I add watermarks. Uh, I end up adding my logo and a marker that talks about what it is. And I create different versions of it because if you're doing things on social network, sometimes you need a high res version, sometimes you need a thumbnail. So I create various versions of that. And then finally, I create two other images. I create an annotated image, which basically overlays information about the object and where it can be found. Now, this is one object, so it's not that interesting. But other larger objects with lots of things going on, it can be fascinating to discover what other things you happen to caption in your field of view. And then I have a finder chart that gives you an idea of exactly what part of the sky that came from. And the little red dot in there is uh, basically, the field of view covered by that particular exposure. Well, that's the final image. Um, I was hoping to get that outer shell. I was pretty happy with the detail that I got, because not only did I get the outer shell, um, I, I captured some things that I didn't fully understand. So, like, if you look in here, it looks like there's a lot of light coming out from the center, and then it looks like it's almost like in shadow, right? The light's not coming out through there. Uh, and I, just all this detail of striations blowing away from the center in there. Um, and I found out later, uh, and you'll see in a second, I, this was chosen by NASA to go on their picture of the day. When they do that, they have a, a, a professional astronomer analyze the image and describe it. And then they have a forum where other professional astronomers go in and debate what they're seeing in the image. And so, I was able to learn a lot of things I never would have learned any other way just by being able to have this image out there. So for amateur astrophotographers, the measure of success is getting something published. Getting something published is hard because even though there aren't that many people doing astrophotography, there are still probably hundreds of thousands across the world. There's only like maybe five or six magazines that people see as serious places you want to get it published. So they get inundated with stuff. So getting your stuff selected can be very difficult. If you get one image uh, published, you feel pretty proud of that. This one is kind of interesting because all of my magazines got uh, uh, chose this image for publication. It went to Amateur Astrophotography Magazine in April, went into Astronomy Magazine in May. Uh, NASA chose it as uh, the picture of the day. First time I've gotten one in there, and that's a huge point of, of pride for me because I'm competing with satellites and professional uh, astronomers, right? And I got one in, so that was pretty cool. Um, it was chosen as the image of the month by BBC Sky at Night. 
And then finally, I got a sky and telescope. So that's the first time I had one picture, made a sweep of all the magazines that I hoped to get it. Usually, if you get it in one, you're pretty happy. So this was a, a big event for me. So moving on, just to wrap things up here quickly, there are other images out there, and there's lots of fascinating devices or there are targets in the sky. And I just thought I'd leave you with a few more just to give you an idea of what's out there. This is called the Wizard Nebula. All of the nebulosity is narrowband, but the stars are actually red, green, and blue. I was able to take the narrowband stars out and add the RGB stars in. Uh, it makes for a very interesting picture. Uh, this is the Rosette Nebula in narrowband. It was the first image I ever got published. This one is the Astronomy Magazine, January of 2022. Um, my small telescope, the wide field, this is one of the first images I took with it. Uh, it's really tough getting into Sky and Telescope magazine. They're just very picky. And they chose this image, and not only they chose it, they put it in as a two-page spread, a center piece, um, which was a big surprise. This is the Elephant Nebula. Uh, this was a uh, published in Amateur uh, Astrophotography magazine. Uh, this is the Bat Nebula. It's part of the Veil Nebula. It's never been published, but it's one of my favorites, just because when you look at the detail, the the uh, uh, smooth, glossy, uh, uh, feathered information in there is so subtle and it's so pretty that it's just amazing that you can pull that out of the sky. There are things like that that have that kind of detail and color in it. So, to wrap this up, behind every successful astrophoto, you're going to find some science, a lot of method, a lot of time that went into it, a little bit of art. Uh, a lot of experience. For every really good image, there's a trail of really bad images that that astrophotographer made on the learning curve as he went through. Um, and then a final takeaway is uh, you can never get rid of your data because in a few years, the processing methods will allow you to do so much more with it. You'll be very tempted to go back and reprocess. And I've done that, especially this year where we've had very bad skies that have been pulling old data out and reprocessing it. So with that, thank you for your attention. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Questions, Gay? Yes. Uh, I don't have $6,500. <laughs> uh, is there a more affordable way to start? Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a fellow that I struck up a friendship with who um, basically got a very wide angle lens that is made by, you know, an off brand manufacturer. He puts that, uh, he, he attached that to first his digital SLR, and then he put it on a, a dedicated camera, but he started with an SLR. And he bought a very inexpensive sky tracker mount. When you're doing real wide angle pictures of the sky, um, your star motion really is so small in angular air that you don't notice it. And he does the most amazing white field pictures I've ever seen. I love his work. And he has a regular lens, a regular camera, and I think the star, star trackers go for maybe like 300 bucks. I think his lens cost him maybe 250. So yeah, you can you can do those things. And he has gear that's more expensive than mine. He goes back and does a lot of photography with a simple gear because he enjoys it. It's a lot of fun. So yeah, you can get started for a lot less. I know solar isn't your expertise, but have you ever tried uh, photographing the sun at all? I personally haven't, but um, I'm a member of the astronomy section of the Rochester Academy of Science, and they have the Max Farish Observatory down in Ionia, and they have one whole observatory that's dedicated to solar work. Um, and one of the guys there is a friend of my wife, so I've gone out there several times, and I've seen him doing the work and doing the captures and seeing it live, and it is fascinating stuff. I mean... It's one thing to see uh, clusters of sunspots, but when they get into specialized filters where they look at the edge of the sun, and you see these arcs of plasma shooting out, the equivalent of the size of the Earth. <laughs> it's it's very impressive. Yeah. Um, was there at any point you got discouraged and thought about selling the equipment? And if so, like what kept you going? The um, no, I kept waiting for that point because I, I have a lot of hobbies in my life. And often I get involved with something and I, I, I tend to go overboard, right? And like, for example, at one point, I love 
guitar music. I want to learn guitar. I bought a lot of guitars. I spent a lot on lessons. And I learned that I play guitar like an engineer. It was not pretty. And it just, I don't have that thing in me that allows me to do it. And I ended up selling all that. But here, for some reason, my background and the way I approach things, it was a good match. You know, having progress. But um, that second telescope or the, that I got two months after, um, I had to sell some of my camera lenses to make my wife happy because I made this $6,000 hole in our budget. A guy bought a lens and I said, hey, on eBay, I said, hey, thanks for buying that lens. You're helping me pay off a bigger lens <laughs> that I bought. He goes, oh, really? He says, I, I tried to do that a few years ago. It didn't work out. I bought this astrophysics you know, uh, telescope and never got it to work. And astrophysics raised the flag because astrophysics are so good that it used to be that you didn't just order it and get it. You signed up for a lottery. Once a year, they would draw names and that won the lottery. You got in the waiting list. The waiting list would then allow you to wait three to five years to get your telescope. So this guy has one he's not using. I go, uh, really? Why are you doing that? He said, I've never figured it out. I said, well, you know, I'm starting to figure this stuff out. I'd be happy to help you. He goes, yeah, it's been sitting in my dining room. And my wife says, if I don't get rid of it, I can't buy any more toys. Well, I got to do something with it. I said, well, what would you sell it for? And he said, well, I don't know. Why don't you make an offer? Well, I just bought this other scope and I couldn't get that, right? So I, I gave him a ridiculous lowball offer and I was afraid I would insult him. And he came back and he said, no, I'll tell you what, throw another thousand in the deal and you can have everything. I go, what do you mean everything? Every piece of astronomical gear I have down to the red flashlights. I mean, he had $5,000 of eyepieces and it, it was ridiculous. We we drove out and met him halfway in the, uh, across the country because he was from Minnesota. Wonderful guy, wonderful wife. We had a wonderful day spent together. We went out to dinner. I got all the gear. He's delighted that it's actually being put to use. I got a bargain of a lifetime. I don't have this kind of luck. I fell into that, but there's a case where a little bit of networking you know, I chatted up the guy, and it's amazing what will happen. So it was such a good deal. My wife was saying, "If you don't, you don't buy this. You're crazy." Well, if you're going to force me here, I will go out and buy this. <laughs> so yeah, I've been, I've been very fortunate, uh, and I haven't, I haven't, I haven't hit that point where I've been frustrated yet. I just, I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah, are you looking into photographing the solar eclipse that we're going to have this upcoming? I, I'm thinking about doing it. I don't do that kind of imaging, and it's a very different. Um, but we're in a realm now where they're starting to sell these uh, automated systems. I just bought this $500 block of plastic and optics that has a telescope, focusing system, filters, a drive, a GPS. You plunk it down, tell it to go into solar mode. It'll automatically figure out where it is. Look at the sun. You have to put a solar filter on. Look at the sun. It'll start imaging. So I actually plan on using this so that I can do the solar eclipse and I can experience it while I have this device actually capturing images. And because the sun is as large and as bright as it is, a very small telescope could do quite a good job. Of it. Are your three scopes, which is your favorite? Um, you all your children. <laughs> I, think it's the first, I think it's the first one and, and it's for a stupid reason. It has all this anodized gold on it. It just looks neat as hell. And the astrophysics is old school. It's all white and old black. And it's like, it does a great job. And all my favorite images come from it. But boy, the eye candy and the other one, it's like, you know, when you're a kid, you had Hot Wheels and you would Hot Rod all your Hot Wheels. Well, you know, I Hot Rodded that. And that's my favorite for a very stupid reason. Anything else, guys? Um, so, like, this guy is very well documented and you're pointing at an object. You expect to see a specific thing. Is there any time you pointed your telescope at something and saw something completely unexpected? Um, yes and no. Um, I took a picture of M13, and if you go to my website and look for my M13 picture, M13 is the largest globular cluster in the sky that everybody takes a picture of it. But I was going through this kit where I learned a lot of techniques 